If we come to Valentine, who was writing on Indonesia in the early 18th century, he mentions Fansur, which he says can be naught else than the famous Pansur, no longer known indeed by that name, but a kingdom which we became acquainted with through Hamza Fansuri, a celebrated poet and a native of this Fansur. It lay in the north angle of the island and a little west of Achin. <coughs> In the early 20th century, uh, Henri Cordier commented, however, nothing could be a little west of Achin. This is a, doubtlessly a slip for a little down the west coast from Aceh. Well, Valentine's map of Aceh, which was produced around about 1724-1740, in fact shows uh, at least one bay to the west of Aceh and uh, then the headland from which you go down the west coast towards Daya and points further to the southeast. Then again, a French map of 1794 shows um, what is what I'm now calling Ujung Panchu or Panchu Head as the Pont, Pont du Roi, the King's Head, headland. And with Ache a short distance uh, further to the to the east, but here we have the uh, uh, two approaches from the Indian Ocean: the uh, Cedar Passage and the Surat Passage below it here. <coughs> and these come in between the islands of the uh, the the um, Ache Head. So you can see that the Bay of Panchu, which is here, is actually a very strategic position in relation to modern Aceh. <coughs> now, looking up the Gazetteer, which was produced by the US Navy Hydrographic Department in 1944, we come across uh, re several references to Panchu. It does mention a village called Panchur, but the name, um, the, the name in the village of the village rather is is now Lambaro, <coughs> the new lamb. Uh, Panchu as a settlement seems to have completely disappeared, but the um, the river mouth, the headland, the bay are still all there. And it seems to me that uh, confusion has arisen due to the fact that the Baris region was the source of camphor par excellence over many centuries. <clears throat> and this has become equated with Fansur, which seemingly, however, disappeared in the 14th century. And this is the very time that uh, colleagues Meltzer and Scheer from the Singapore Earth Observatory now tell us that uh, major seismic events, major tsunamis occurred in the years 1390 and 1450. So there's a very close, close relation between the disappearance of Fansur and uh, seismic events of the 14th and 15th century. <coughs> These events have been identified by fragments of coral rubble and uh, rings in coral on the west coast islands of Sumatra with also uh, debris found in the Bay of Lubuk uh, in the next bay east from the Krung Raya in um, Aceh Basar. So let's come back to the, the Bay of Panchu. <clears throat> Panchu is some 12 kilometers west of modern Banda Aceh and lies immediately east of uh, Ujung Masamuka, Aceh Head, and Ujung Panchu, or Panchu Head. Now for some reason in the past, uh, European scholars who were trying to 
pinpoint where Fansur may have been uh, so for some reason maybe due to decent maps uh, persistently failed to locate anything that related to Fansu on this north coast of Sumatra. <coughs> what was, I think, something of a red herring was the name Fansu, which appears near Barus, but it's an inland site, it's not a coastal site. And if we look at the sources that we have on Fansu, uh, they, they suggest anyway that it was most definitely a harbour, it certainly was not an inland uh, polity. So I think following the discovery of a site in Panchu in 1975, and since then we can verify that Lamri was uh, on the Krung Raya, uh, the name Panchu suggests to me that this was indeed ancient Fansu. The name uh, Panchu in our Chinese is the same as the Malay Fansu, which means a spring of fresh water. And these are some pictures of what the area looked like back in 1986. Uh, you can see it's quite shallow. Um, there's mangrove in the background there. And uh, this is taken from the shoreline around um, Lamtengo with the island of Pulo Tuan in the bay up here and pull away in the background on the horizon. And at that time, you can see there was still a lot of mangrove growing in the bay. And along the, this bit along here was actually a beech ridge, some four or five meters high at that time, but being gradually eroded by the tides and the sinkage that was going on. Uh, Sometime during the 1970s, the Royal Australian Air Force undertook a, an aerial survey for, the, for mapping purposes of the island of Sumatra. And I have two frames here which show the Bay of Panchu as it was in about 1975. Uh, much of the ground which is shown on the photographs has now disappeared completely, it's underwater. Uh, <coughs> although briefly exposed perhaps at a um, low tide. And uh, a second frame will show a, a submerged uh, rectangular structure, which was said to be the second mosque of the Lambara Nujid village, um, which may be seen to the right of the alluvial fan beside the mouth of the Panchu River. So here we have uh, the edge of the higher ground is around here. The bit in the middle is a beech ridge. The, the uh, mouth of the Panchu River. And you can just about make out uh, a rectangular structure here. And the Pulo Tuan is off to the right there. But um, <coughs> this is all gone now, completely disappeared. It is exposed at low tide. Uh, there's a burial ground which was uh, hidden in this uh, undergrowth along here, which is now pretty well all exposed, um, but only at low water. But uh, the rest of it was just devastated by the tsunami, and so the few remains that were visible at this point, at 1986, have all pretty well disappeared. Oh yes, here is the rectangular structure which we actually discovered two years ago. Um, it's now quite a way offshore. This, the, 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 the whitish sand bank area to the left of this picture is now uh, inundated at high tide. But there are walls in a rectangular form uh, which we are told are the walls of the old mosque, or the second mosque. The first mosque was, uh, according to the villagers, out near the village of um, Pulo Tuan. <coughs> so um, the modern satellite imagery shows the remains of all the fish ponds which were constructed 
prior to 2004. But there are other remains of rectangular structures which were formerly burial grounds. Now, um, as I was able to visit the same area between 1986 and 2005, I've been able to document the changes which have taken place there. Um, 1986, at low tide, there was a fair amount of domestic rubbish exposed on the beach. Uh, there would be round circular traces which may have been wells or they may have been where they put the water jars that stood at the foot of uh, the traditional Achenese houses for guests to wash their feet before they entered the house. The whole place was littered with broken ceramics of one kind or another, earthenware <coughs> and imported uh, uh, wares. Also the bay was full of drowning trees. Uh, you can see in this picture remains of tree stumps and around here, uh, out here, um, <coughs> showing that the process of substance had been actually quite gradual and that the trees had been there not so very many years before I visited it. Uh, these were fishermen uh, working with their nets in the shallow waters of the bay and again with plenty of evidence for brown, uh, drowning trees and uh, mangrove in the background. And this is a colleague of mine who was working in Atchee in 1986, Bruce Harker, with, with a USAID project, uh, pointing out uh, coral-covered uh, um, Achenese gravestones from presumably the 16th century, which are now completely covered at high tide with plenty of mangroves still in existence at that point. And this was a burial ground in 1986. This has pretty well all disappeared. Um, other Islamic grave markers from around the bay at that time. Uh, not a very good definition, I'm afraid, of another burial ground with quite elaborate grave markers, which I, I can date, I think, to the 16th century. Uh, another same shot of the, another burial ground there. And you can see how steeply the mountains behind the, gray, uh, uh, behind the bay actually uh, go up there. This is all limestone, which has been thrust up at some point in the past. So that the, the bay is completely enclosed by uh, limestone ridges. Uh, a local chap sitting on a bateau ache, as they're called. Uh, according to him, the falling gravestone was actually the grave marker of the mother of the first sultan of Aceh. Now, whether that is true or not, who knows? But um, it was certainly an impressive piece of masonry. It was over two meters in height. And uh, the whole area at that time was littered with these... Uh, Batu Aceh. This was the external part of the beach ridge. Um, you can see how shallow it is. There's a chap out here with a fishing net, uh, 100 yards or more offshore. And at this point, uh, we were finding human bones. Uh, there was a skull and burial boards being washed out of the beach ridge by, by the tides. So um, places that had been high and dry not so very many generations earlier were now being completely eaten up by the sea. Uh, the earliest ceramic evidence for habitation so far in this area uh, is the, the, uh, these Chinese uh, cellars and sherds from Longchuan and Chekchiang, which we can date to about the 12th or 13th centuries. <coughs> uh, you can still find the occasional sherd because there is ongoing erosion and redeposition created by the tides and the waves. And... Uh, <coughs> It's a piece of uh, South Chinese whiteware from the same period. Uh, sherds of 
uh, grey glazed ring bowls from Ch uh, Chunzhou, which one can date to the 13th and 14th centuries. Uh, Thai wares, late 14th, 15th century, uh, Sawankalok, uh, Celadons, and the black and on white glazed material. A uh, piece of Burmese ware from about the same time, as far as I know. Uh, Vietnamese sherds from the 15th century, perhaps. Uh, South Chinese swata ware, 16th century, with an incised fish. Um, Japanese arita ware, probably the 17th century. Uh, Karatsu ware, also from Japan which is quite rare in this sort of context. <clears throat> Probably imported through Surabaya or Banton at that point. Uh, and a fragment of relatively high-fired uh, reddish earthenware. Now, this is actually very important because this is a type of South Asian red earthenware which turns up at sites which were occupied by South Asians or Tamils uh, from about the 11th century through to, well, certainly uh, the same people were in Malacca in the 15th century, 16th century. So uh, this sort of stuff has found, turned up in digging for house foundations in Malacca. Um, it's also turned up in Singapore. So we have a, a network of similar sherdage, which uh, appears at Numerous medieval sites in South India, in Sri Lanka, um, on the Malay Peninsula, Singapore, and umpteen sites in, uh, on the island of Sumatra, including Lamre, uh, Panchu, Barus on the west coast, Kota China, um, and uh, Pulo Kampe on the east coast. And this is a ubiquitous type of earthenware which we can now link to Tamil traders or at least South Asian traders from the medieval period. Uh, some local earthenware, which so far is pretty anonymous but quite distinctive, um, probably produced locally, and a map, uh, a lamp with um, seven spouts designed to be hung by a cord from a rafter of a house. The uh, central part is hollow and a cord would be passed through it and it could be tied up to a, a beam or something. And You put a uh, oil in the reservoir and wicks made of uh, uh, fibers from reeds or whatever and it would provide quite a good light. Um, a fragment of bronze material from Panchu with inscribed Islamic um, writing, which is very angular, I suppose, because it was done with uh, metal. Um, haven't had this anybody being, being able to read it yet, but uh, I'm not sure whether it will provide any useful information to us or not. But anyway, um, this is the sort of stuff that's turning up in the intertidal inter zone in the Bay of Panchu. And there is ongoing erosion and uh, redeposition there. <clears throat>